Well, for those that think it's cold, I will point out we actually have a gentleman here wearing shorts. So I think it's a matter of mind over matter. <laughs> I noticed that most of our folks who've come from the islands are inside. They have thinner blood. I think that's what it is. Uh, I had the privilege of having lunch with Jim Zeger. He was our former associate pastor. He sends you his greetings. He had traveled out from Pennsylvania for his uh, regular cardiac heart checkup. And uh, so it's nice to be able to meet with him. He and Michelle are doing well, but they miss being here very much, and we miss having him here. That's why on occasion they will even make the uh, two-plus-hour drive to, to make it here uh, to be with us. On uh, Saturday, November 7th, Jim Zeger is going to be coming out to do a special seminar for us uh, on how to use eSword Bible software for Bible study. The timing of this is to match the hermeneutics class so that the folks in it can uh, get a little more at debt with something that will help them with their, their uh, homework. Um, it is open to everyone, anybody who'd like to uh, learn some skills on using one of these Bible programs. Uh, it, it is very helpful. Uh, eSword, the base program is free. There's a link on our website on how to download that and put it on your computer. Uh, it is expandable and it's fairly low cost. In fact, one of the reasons there are so many books uh, in the church there, that's Jim Zeger's library, or a portion of it. Uh, a lot of that is stuff that he either ha already has on his Bible program or things he just doesn't think he's gonna be able uh, to be using in the future and he wants to bless somebody else. So help yourself to any of those books. But Saturday, November 7th, 10 a.m., uh, he's going to be doing that. Bring your laptop or computer device, and then you can help follow along. It'd be a good um, training seminar. Now, meeting with Jim reminded me of the difficulty that people have in trying to find a good church when they move away. Uh, they've been gone for a couple years, and they've still been having trouble. They did find one that's about 45 minutes away up on top of a hill, which kind of eliminates it in the winter because they can't get up the hill. It's uh, icy and snowy. Jim said he got spoiled coming here, uh, but all he really is looking for, he just wants a church where the pastor is going to be centered on the Scripture, explaining what the Scriptures mean, and seeking to make appropriate application from the proper interpretation of the Scripture in its context, and with people who love Christ and fellow believers. Tragically, that's not always easy to find because so many pastors have been trained to be something other than biblical preachers. They may be good at homiletics, but they're not good at actually digging into the scriptures and explaining what God has said. It becomes more of their own musings. And without a solid foundation of scriptures, the people are not going to mature as they should in their walk with Christ and with one another. Muddled preaching results in mediocre lives. It's not enough to want to minister to others. You also have to have the proper motives mixed with a proper example if you're going to serve the Lord for his glory and accomplish his purposes. Now, we have been studying 1 Thessalonians because it is commended by Paul as a model church. It's a good example for us. They set an example for the other churches not only Macedonia, but beyond, to follow. And then they went beyond that, they received the gospel, and then they went proclaiming it everywhere. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10, Paul put it this way, that they had turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now, the reality of that conversion was demonstrated and then becoming an example to the believers of Macedonia and Achaia. Now, Thessalonica was a major port town on the Ignatian Highway. We talked about that before. And so that highway went east and west through Macedonia, and the word spread along that from, Mas from uh, Thessalonica. But as a port town, they also would sail south into Achaia. That's that lower area of Greece. And, uh, and people were hearing the gospel from them. In addition, as a port town, you had people who were sailors in Thessalonica, and they would go all over the known world, and they would report about what they saw there. 
They didn't have to be Christians. They were just saying, hey, this is what happened, you know, while we were in Thessalonica. Here's what these people were like. Can you believe what they believe? Wow. So Paul said we didn't have to even to say anything about the Thessalonians because the report was going all over. Now, a major reason for this kind of response in Thessalonica was the example that was set before them by Paul and his co-laborers, Luke, Silas, and Timothy. And we gain a greater insight into the example of these missionaries here in chapter 2. The text actually says in chapter 1, they became imitators, chapter 1, verse 6, they became imitators of Paul and his companions. And so looking at how Paul did things, what their motives were, what these missionaries were doing, is a good example of us if we're going to be effective in ministry. Now, in the last sermon in this series three weeks ago, I examined the missionaries' motives for ministry explained in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 6. Let me quickly review that because today's sermon on verses 7 through 12 are based upon that. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 6. For you know yourselves, excuse me, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. Now, Paul contrasts their coming and their motives to the religious hucksters that were common at that time that preyed on the, the, the people. The people were ignorant. And so feigning to be messengers from the gods, they would exploit these people for personal gain. Paul and his companions came with a true message from God, demonstrated by, first, they're boldly proclaiming the message, though they are opposed, and they had already suffered for it. Second, their earnest appeals concerning their message without any error to mislead them, any impurity to exploit them, or any trickery to deceive them. Paul strengthened his argument by pointing out they did not come with flattering speech. They did not come with a hidden, hidden agenda of greed because their motive was to please God and not men. They did not seek any kind of glory from anyone. They did not even use their right, the authority they had as apostles, to take a collection for their own support. Now, all these things demonstrated that they came with pure motives to deliver a pure message by pure means. Now, that's a contrast to the religious hucksters that came with motives of greed, with a message of error, and impurity delivered with flattery and deceit. And yes, those same kinds of people are still around, some of them claiming to be Christians. They're still around. Paul and his companions showed that their motives were completely different. Now, as we continue in verses 7 through 12, Paul makes a further contrast with these religious hucksters by pointing out how they behaved among the Thessalonians, which again demonstrates this purity of motives, purity of message, and purity of, of method. He does this out by pointing four areas of their examples. Their example of affection, their example of labor, their example of behavior, their example of exhortation. His case is made easy because these Thessalonians were witnesses of each of these truths. And Paul reminds them, or he calls uh, them to remember these things. Look at verse 7. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers." Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children. 
so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, Paul begins with a very strong conjunction here, but it's Allah in the Greek. It's a contrast compared to what they could have done. And there would be some sense here that he's referring to as apostles, they could have uh, required something. I pointed out in the previous sermon on this, Paul made the point in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 18, that as an apostle, he had the proper right to receive compensation for the work that he was doing. In fact, he even pointed out that Jesus had talked about this, that the labor is worthy of his hire, that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. However, I believe the strong contrast he's making here in verses 7 and 7 is really against these Charlton hucksters. He had described them in verses 3 through 6. These were men who exploited others by flattery, by deceit, and that hid their greed. They came for themselves. Paul and his companions were the opposite. They came to give, as shown in the illustration given here. This analogy says, they proved to be gentle among them. The verb here, again, amai, has a root meaning of having or acquiring, acquiring certain characteristics. And so it's often translated as become or became. Many other versions, I'm using the NAS, other versions simply translate this as we were. The sense is that in contrast to the religious hucksters, they were characterized by a very different quality. They were gentle, gentle in their midst. The word is translated as kind in 2 Timothy 2.24, being contrasted with being quarrelsome. This is a characteristic that's further described by this analogy of a nursing mother tenderly caring for her own children. Now, the term for caring here, or also translated as cherish, falpo, literally refers to keeping warm. Some of you sitting outside would like that right now. <laughs> Keeping warm. You'd be hard-pressed to have a better description of something that's gentle than a mother nursing her child and keeping her baby warm with her own body. That's Paul's description of their behavior with the Thessalonians. So in contrast to the religious charlatans who came to exploit by any means possible, they came to give and care as a mother would for her own child. Now, let me briefly comment here. There is a debate. There's a textual problem right here. Some of you may have a translation that translates this as an infant. Uh, it's an issue of, the, of one letter, the Greek nu. Does it belong at the end of the previous word or the beginning of this word? If it is trans, if it be, at the beginning of this word, it's infant. And again, some of you have translations that say that. And there's good manuscript evidence both ways. I think the context fits better the idea of gentle than an infant because a nursing mother is gentle with her child and does not like an, act like an infant herself. So just to let you know there is a textual issue here. Now, in keeping with that description, Paul next states he had or they had a yearning affection for them. This is actually a very rare word that he uses here. According to uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it is to feel oneself drawn to something with strong intensification of the feeling. A sense of this kind of strong feeling he had is, can be noted that the word is used on burial inscriptions of a parent's longing for their dead child. That's the intensity by which they long for them. That is not the kind of warm inward attachment a false teacher would have for his followers that he's exploiting. But it is the attachment the missionaries had for the Thessalonians. Now, it should be noted here, this is either in a middle or passive participle, meaning that it's not something they generated themselves. If it's middle, it, they had some action, but middle or passive, there's an action that God is having upon them. I think sometimes we mean this very thing when we might use the, the phrase, God has placed it on my heart. It's not something that came up just my own. Something has affected me. It's now on my heart to do something. And that's what's going on here. It's only really a, a, 
way I think you can explain this very common phenomenon among missionaries, they quickly develop a loving and sacrificial commitment to people they hardly knew when they got there, or they already have a heart for them, even though they've never met them. They've only read about them and know the need that they have. And that includes going to places where they know they will be opposed. They know they may be a martyr. And yet, that is what's on their heart. God has been working on them. God places upon the heart to pursue an endeavor, and so they're not shaken by whatever comes up. And really the same is true, though perhaps to a lesser degree of extreme sacrifice, for people who take up all sorts of different ministries within their own nation, culture, community. God places upon the hearts of his people to serve him in a certain way, and that is part of the mystical side of God directing us. Some things are very cognitive, but there's also an emotional side of it. There is a sense of God moving upon us. There's a spiritual side, a mystical side. God places it upon your heart to go do something. Are you seeking to serve the Lord? Then ask yourself, what has God placed on your heart? What burden has he given to you? Now, Paul started with a burden to preach the gospel. He described himself actually in, with the word compulsion to preach the gospel in 1 Corinthians 6, or 9, 16. And he knew he had been appointed by the Lord directly in Acts 26, 16 through 20 to preach the gospel. So he had a burden, he had a compulsion. And that may have begun without a whole lot of emotion, but it did de develop as he do, did what God wanted to do. It began with a simple desire to use whatever gifts he had. And the same thing's true with us. It begins with a simple desire. I want to serve God according to however he's gifted me. I want to do something. I want to please him. I want to glorify him. But the emotion of having a strong desire to serve people God has put before you also develops as you step forward in faith, God supplying what is needed as it's needed. It increases, it gains, it it grows. Now, Paul goes on the rest of verse 8 to state the result of that affectionate desire and the reason behind their behavior, for they, quote, were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. They took pleasure in filling their desires by sharing with the Thessalonians the two things they had, the gospel of God and their own lives, actually souls here. As itinerant missionaries, they would not have had much in the way of material goods, but they shared what they had, which actually was much more valuable. The first is the gospel of God. Now, sometimes the gospel is mentioned so often in churches that we kind of take it for granted and we start losing the significance. Now, him stating this is the gospel of God would be very striking to the pagan audience he was talking to. The message from the gods were usually demands. And the gods were things that they feared. They would do all sorts of things trying to appease the gods with the hope that God would not do something bad to them, or at least leave them alone, and maybe even do something good. But a message from God that is good would pick up their ears. And that's what gospel is, euangelion, good news, good news from God. This good news from God was radically different from all that they would have heard as pagans. It is a message of what God was giving, not demanding. A message given about what God has done in reconciling man to himself. It's a message of perfect love, which casts out all fear, as the Apostle John explains in 1 John 4, 18. It's a message that removes God's wrath from man so that he can stand before God with no condemnation, because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel of God is a message of good news that radically changed the Thessalonians out of love for him so that they turned from idols to serve God. And they, again, they served him out of love, not fear. That's a radically different message, isn't it? 
Paul's letter to the Romans is really his gospel tract. And he starts off his good news, verse 16, is that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for Jews and Gentiles alike. But immediately he goes into the bad news. So God has, the gospel is this power of salvation, but here's the bad news. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody's under God's condemnation because his wrath is abiding on the, the, the unrighteous. And then he explains there are three different groups of unrighteous. The immoral unrighteous, end of chapter 118. Through uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. Verse. And then there's the <clears throat> moral unrighteous in chapter 2, 1 through 16, and the religious unrighteous in chapter 2, 17 through 29. Now, some people are obviously unrighteous. Their outward behavior is so immoral, it's just it's blatant. That's the immoral unrighteous. He describes them. Then there are the moral unrighteous. They think themselves to be better than the immoral ones because, well, it's not, they're not as bad. But Paul points out they actually do the same thing, so not to the degree. They not, may not be robbing the bank, but they're robbing other people. They're taking stuff from work. They're pilfering. They're still stealing. They may not be as wicked as <laughs> some could get, but they're still doing the same thing. They're immoral, and it will condemn them. And then there is the religious. The religious and righteous believed themselves to be pious, but they were self-righteous, twisting what God had said in his word so that they could continue on with what they wanted to do. And they stood condemned. Wrapping up in chapter 3, he says, all have fallen short, or actually falling short of the glory of God. There is none good, not one. So the good news starts with bad news. Until you are convicted by the Holy Spirit of your sin and the condemnation that comes with that, you're not going to look to God for salvation. Now Paul then goes on with the good news. He goes on to describe Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah promised by the prophets of old, who came as the second Adam to die as a demonstration of God's love in paying the redemption price of man's sin. Why? So that he would be the just and justifier of those who would have faith in him. Faith in Jesus Christ is reckoned by God to be righteousness, so that the one who believes is justified, made righteous. That faith brings about a death of self and a resurrection to new life in Christ, which is beautifully portrayed in baptism. Our own identification with Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Now, as slaves of righteousness, chapters 4 through 6, we are freed from our old master's sin, and we're given eternal, uh, given eternal life as a free gift. Now, we're going to have troubles in this world. Paul doesn't ignore that. That's chapter 7. But we have a hope that transcends it, since we look forward to Christ's return and a transfer, our transformation and glorification. That's chapter 8. And at the end of that chapter, he makes it absolutely positive. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's hope. That's good news. But notice the way that Paul states what they were pleased to impart. It was, quote, not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, unquote. Now, as traveling itinerant religious men, they would be expected to have some kind of message from their God. Though the gospel that they were preaching was very different than what they would have been hearing from the religious hucksters. But they did something the religious hucksters would not. They gave their own lives. Literally, again, souls here, sukkas. They were not aloof like the common would be common for religious authorities that presented themselves as superior. They were personal with them. They got involved with them, and that requires vulnerability. Because when you become personal with people, they get to see your weaknesses as well as your strengths. They see your flaws. That means you're going to have to be humble too, right? And that's how they came. They shared with them their very souls. 
Now, that's still necessary for anyone that's going to have a ministry that is effective according to God's standards because God is looking at the hearts of people, not the outward facade. As I read many years ago in a book dealing with pastoral ministry, if you're going to really deal with your people right, you've got to bleed with them. They've got to know you. You've got to be involved with them. That's how ministry goes forward. Be Many years ago, when I left uh, California to come here, there was a, a dinner that was held to say goodbye to me. And there was a man I had been discipling for several years by then. So he attended my Bible studies. I met with him personally. Uh, the last year I was there, I was doing the preaching as well. So he had heard me many, many, many times. So as he's saying goodbye to me in front of everybody else, and they're all telling stories, he goes, you know, Scott, I don't remember anything you taught me. Well, that's really encouraging. Thanks. All these years, you don't remember any of it? And he says, but you've changed my life by how you've lived with me. That's the issue. And that's what Paul and his companions did. They got involved. And it changed lives. Why did Paul and his companions do this? Because the Thessalonians, he says, had become very dear to them. They had come to love them. And that reinforces what Paul says earlier about them having this affectionate desire toward them. There's no doubt that as Christians, we could be prickly at times, right? Why? We're saved sinners. We're not glorified saints yet. Someday, but not yet. Yet we're commanded to love one another as Christ has loved us. And by that, all men will know we are his disciples. If that's not true in your own life, then you need to consider the reason why and change it. Our love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ should be greater than even our own family, unless, of course, that family is also Christians. That should be the mark of our lives. Now, in verses 7 and 8, Paul makes his case with direct st statements about their example of labor. This is what they did and what they desired. Three examples of proof here for this claim, because each of these are things that would, they would have known as witnesses. They would have observed these things in them. He begins with verse 9, uh, verse 7. You recall, brethren, our labor, or it's verse 9. You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, Paul is not claiming they have forgotten their example. He is asking them to recall to think about it again. That's the specific word here. It's specifically their labor and hardship. Remember these things. Recall this to mind. Think about it. And he uses these two words together three different times, twice in 1 Thessalonians, uh, twice just here in 1 Thessalonians. Labor comes from a word, uh, kapan, which means beaten, and came to mean weariness as if one had been beaten and became a common term uh, to refer to physical work that caused fatigue. Hardship here, moxon, refers to physical or mental toil. The combination meant they were tired physically and mentally to the point of weariness. And that's quite understandable because he notes here, they worked night and day. Why? So they would not be a financial burden to any of them and also being able to proclaim the gospel. Now, it was common in Jewish culture at that time that even if a man was going to pursue scholarship, he was also taught a trade. Actually, a very practical side of that is because a lot of times, you might be a scholar, but you wouldn't be able to earn much of a living because you're going to be paid much. And so they'd have a trade by which they would supplement their income and be able to make it. Now, we know from Acts 18.3 that Paul was a tent maker, that he worked with Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth at that very trade. That's what he had been taught. And actually, it was a great trade for him to have because it meant wherever he could go, he could make tents or join with those making tents. And that's what he did. That became his common practice. He was not against receiving support from established churches. In fact, he did receive support from the Philippians. 
It's noted in 2 Corinthians and Philippians 1.7. But Paul did not want to be a financial burden on, to those to whom he was preaching the gospel. And so Paul and the others, they worked hard at their trades to support themselves. Now, we know Luke was a physician, Colossians 4.14. We don't know the trades of Silas or Timothy, but they were doing whatever to make a living. At the same time, on top of that, they are preaching and teaching these people. No wonder they're tired. Physically and mentally, this would be exhausting. But you know what? This is still a common practice of evangelical missionaries around the world. They receive support from established churches that they might preach free of charge to those they are, that are hearing the gospel from them and where they're trying to establish a church. Mission, many missionaries, even those in small churches here throughout the United States, they work other jobs to support themselves and then do their church work on top of that. These are men to be respected very highly. Now, the next example Paul reminds them about is their behavior among them. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. He cites two witnesses here. The Thessalonians saw Paul and his companions, what they were like outwardly. But he also calls God as a witness because God knew what he, they were like inwardly. Now, Paul's claim here is that they were devout, upright, and blameless in their behavior toward the Thessalonians that were believing. Devout, uh, seos, it's actually a related word to the word for holy, hognos. It's uh, fulfilling divine law or holy customs due to inward attitude. And it's a characteristic of God that he actually wants us to have. Think 1 Peter 1, 5, 15 and 16. You shall be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. The Thessalonians would have observed the missionaries' piety and God knew their hearts. Upright, dikaios, is, refers to being and doing what is right. And it's a contrast to sin in 1 Corinthians 15, 34. And it describes moral living here in this passage, also in, second, or in uh, rather Titus 2, 12. Blameless, amemptos, is to be without blame, to be guiltless, to be innocent. They conducted themselves in a righteous manner in obedience to the Lord's command, so they really could not be blamed for anything. Again, their outward behavior would have been obvious, and God knew their hearts. If you're going to serve the Lord, then take what Paul says here to heart. The people you seek to serve will learn more about you, what it means to walk with Christ by your example in life than they will by what you say. Why? Simply because those who are younger in faith, those who are less mature, are going to look to you as a supposed more mature model of what they should do, how they should live. More is caught than taught. Don't confuse your message by living contrary to what you say. What is true for parents with their children is also true in ministry, regardless of whatever it is your spiritual gift may be. Because your attitude is conveyed as you minister to others. Paul and his companions were affected because their lives matched what they proclaimed. What would others testify about you based on your example to them? It would be similar to what would be said of Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. If so, praise God. And that's where it should be. If it is not what you would like it to be, then you need to start making changes today. Examine yourself, identify what needs to be changed, make a plan to change it, and then share that with someone else who's going to encourage you and hold you accountable to it. This is where our lives should be going. Now, the final example Paul sets forth is how they conducted their ministry. Paul again points out these are things they already knew about them. They would remember them as witnesses or they'd be known, uh, they'd know about it from being told by firsthand witnesses. Verse 11 and 12. Just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, there is a normal and natural difference in the way a mother and a father acts towards their children. 
back in verse 7, Paul used the analogy of a mother caring for her children, explaining their own gentleness and care for the Thessalonians. A good mother sacrificially nurtures her children and ensures they're protected, safe, comforted, and usually well-fed too. A mother will have to correct her children, may have to be stern at times, but she is the one the children are going to go to when they're hurt or afraid and they want to be comforted. A father's role is different. Among his responsibilities is planning and preparing his children for the future so that they will be mature and become godly men and women who will be a blessing in society. Yes, he should be tender toward his children, but he also needs to be firm to make sure the lessons are learned and that character is developed. Paul used the example of a father with his own children to explain these additional aspects of his ministry to the Thessalonians. Paul points out that they know how they were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring them toward a proper walk with God. Exhorting, parakaleo, is a compound word combining alongside with to call. Now that idea gives it a fairly wide range of meanings. Uh, you can think of it as the, the coach who is shouting at the athlete, you know, to get, you know, moving, keep going, I know you're tired, keep going, and there's, there's a shouting, but it's an encouraging kind of shouting. It's exhorting. Keep going, right? So that's one aspect of it. It could also be reminding someone about great truths that will comfort them when feeling down. Or it could be earnestly requesting someone to take action. Encouraging here, pramu thalamai, is another compound word combining the word toward to speak to someone. It was used in John 11 of those who had gathered around Martha and Mary to console them. So you can see it's a little more gentle than exhort. Paul used it in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 in the sense of encourage as a means to help the faint-hearted get motivated again. Imploring, martyramai, originally meant to invoke someone as a witness about something. And in fact, that is the more common way it's used. In Acts, and Galatians, Ephesians, it is translated as to testify. But it took on this additional meaning of making an emphatic demand as used in this verse, and hence translated in various versions as implore, charge, insist, testify, urge. The specific action they are encouraging, they're imploring, they're exhorting about, is that they walk in a manner of the God who is calling them into his own kingdom and glory. That's what he wants them to accomplish. Now, Paul made similar statements in Ephesians 4.1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore, actually exhort here, parakaleo, you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you're called. The idea is that they were to live their life in a way that reflects that they have been reconciled with God and called to live for his glory. That was the manner of life that Paul and his companions had demonstrated to them while they were with them. Now over in Colossians, we read that earlier. Colossians 1, 9 through 12. Paul gives a further description of this. He says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, the marks of such a life then, of a pleasing God, well, is first is pleasing God. That's, that becomes the goal. That's the motive. But it also is bearing fruit in every good work. There's going to be an increase in the knowledge of God. You're going to be demonstrating that you're being strengthened by the Holy Spirit to be steadfast and patient. There is going to be a joy in giving thanks to God the Father. 
and there's going to be looking forward to sharing in the glorious inheritance of the saints. These are the things that mark that someone who's walking with God properly. The means by which this is attained in Colossians is being filled with the knowledge of God's will in spiritual wisdom and understanding, which comes by the Holy Spirit through his word. And that's why Paul was diligent to pray for them and why we have to be diligent to pray for one another. Now, that all sounds fairly complex, right? Let me reduce this down to something simple. Because it is simple. All that Paul is talking about here, this idea of walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which God has called you, means you're going to live according to what you say you believe in the gospel. It really is that simple. If you are claiming that you believe the gospel, that means that you believe that Jesus is a Christ, he is the eternal son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, so he's also human, he's the one who is God and man, 100% God, 100% man, you believe that he lived a sinless life. You believe that he died as a substitute sacrifice for your sin so that you could be redeemed by him and offered salvation. You believe that he then rose from the dead on the third day. He's ascended to heaven. He is currently at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, but also preparing a place for you in heaven. And one day he's coming back and he's going to take you to be with him forever. If that's what you believe, there's changes in your life, isn't there? Because what is important in life changes. That belief becomes essential. And so you're going to walk in a different way than the way you did before. God is God. You are not. The gospel demands that. The gospel demands you understand that Jesus is Lord, is your creator, he's your designer. You work much better according to his design, since he designed you, than you will according to what you think. So again, that's going to change the way you live, isn't it? Why then do we need to be exhorted, encouraged, and implored? If really it comes down to something so simple as just living according to what we say we believe? I think the problem is threefold. First is ignorance of what God has said. A lot of people, they just don't know. That's the great tragedy in so many churches. Instead of teaching the Bible, they're teaching all sorts of other things, trying to get a massive audience to come, make them feel good, and they leave ignorant of what Scripture says. I need to know what the Bible says because that's how God has revealed himself. So ignorance is one of the problems. The second is there's still a remnant of worldly desire within us, and we're going to be fighting that. Romans 7 talks about that. And then there's the pressure of the world, as Romans 12 talks about it, seeking to conform us to this image. And so we do need to be exhorted. We need to be encouraged. We need to be implored to walk in such a manner, worthy of the calling, to be reminded of the great truths that we will do what he wants, not what we think is best. Really, it comes down to this. I'm a citizen of God's kingdom, am I not? I'm already a citizen of heaven. I'm an ambassador here. I need to live according to what my real citizenship is. Now, Paul has made a solid case here to the Thessalonians by calling them to remember they had witnessed themselves about the behavior and motivation of Paul and Luke and Silas and Timothy. And they were nothing like the religious charlatans, these hucksters who came about exploiting people with false messages from false gods. Paul and his companions came because they were compelled by the true God to bring to them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They came without flattery. They came out without any hidden agenda. They came at their own expense and they earned their own way, laboring night and day to the point of weariness to provide for themselves to proclaim the gospel to them free of charge. They came with the gentleness and the care of a mother who is nursing her child, and the diligence of a father who is training his children to maturity. They came as men who are devout and upright and blameless in their behavior. And it is wise for us, every single one of us, to follow that example in our own lives and in our ministry because life is not about your kingdom. It's about God's kingdom and his glory. Remembering that 
and then living accordingly is the path to success and what matters most in life. And that's eternity, not the present. We're living in the present with a view for eternity. And that changes everything, doesn't it? Father, thank you for the encouragement that we receive when we look at this example of Paul and his companions. And we recognize it's difficult. There are a lot of things that are set against us. And yet, there are those around us who will know the Word of God, so they teach it to us. They care about us, and so they seek to encourage us, to lift us up, to build us up. And Father, they'll even implore us. Father, we recognize at times we need all of that. We need the uplifting. We need Sometimes we just need to even be dragged along to do what is right before you, to live for you with the right motivations. Father, we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who continues to change our hearts. Father, to make them what they were not before. I would ask that if anyone is here today or catches this sermon on um, media, that, Father, your spirit would be merciful and gracious to convict them of sin, of righteousness and judgment, that they might turn to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe the gospel. Father, to know what you have done for them. And Father, begin a new life, a new journey in life that's going to heaven, not to destruction. Because the price is paid in Christ. He's done everything. Father, for those of us who are Christians, that your Holy Spirit may prod us on to greater holiness in our lives. Being greater examples of Christ living through us to those around us. Father, more diligence in our ministry to others and allowing others to minister to us that we all might mature and that way bring glory to you on this earth. For indeed, we do want your kingdom to come. We want its manifestation in the present to be seen in us even while we wait for Christ to return from heaven and set up the physical kingdom. Glorify yourself, Lord, in us. In Jesus' name, amen.